We've spent a lot of time talking about vaccines, and rightfully so, since that's the most effective way to quash the pandemic. At the same time, though, we're also developing therapeutics to treat COVID. One area that has shown considerable success are monoclonal antibodies. Clinical trials show that monoclonal antibody treatment, actually a combination of two antibodies, reduces COVID-19-related hospitalization or deaths in high-risk patients by about 70%. And when given to an exposed person, like someone living with an infected person, monoclonal antibodies reduce their risk of developing an infection with symptoms by 80%. There has been tremendous development just in the last couple of months in terms of exactly who qualifies and when, as well as how they're given. I had the opportunity to sit down with Dr. George Ancopoulos, co-founder, president, and chief scientific officer of Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, to talk about why they decided to invest in research for monoclonals, what their research shows about their use, as well as what the COVID pandemic has taught him personally and professionally. George, thanks for joining me today. Sure, it's a pleasure. Now, I want to start off with everyone's talking about the vaccines, and, and rightfully so, but Regeneron decided to focus on therapeutics. Can you walk us through that reasoning? Well, uh, there's so much need for so many approaches to fight back against this pandemic. And um, you do what your technologies allow you to do. Uh, we had spent decades developing some of the world's best technology to create antibodies against almost any target. We had used this to fight an assortment of different diseases, including uh, recently and relatively successfully Ebola. So we realized while there was a lot of efforts on vaccines, and as you said, vaccines are absolutely essential to trying to create immunity within the population, um, as we're seeing now, despite the vaccines, there's the potential for there to still be a lot of disease burden. And there will also be people such as the immunocompromised who will never respond to vaccines. So we reasoned that there would be a great need to provide what it is that vaccines try to generate. Vaccines try to generate antibodies in people. Well, some people can't generate those antibodies. For some people, they're not vaccinated. For some people, it's too late. So for those people, we reasoned we could make those antibodies, give them back to these people, and we had developed the technologies. We had invested decades and decades mm -hmm. into technologies that could optimize the approach for rapidly generating the best of antibodies. So we chose to do what we could do to complement what was going on in the rest of the world. And can you explain for our audience what monoclonal antibodies do? Because it can be confusing. We refer to them as monoclonal, sometimes polyclonal. We use the word cocktail. At the simple level, what does your technology do? Well, the important thing is to understand what antibodies are. Antibodies are what the body uses to fight back against disease. They can literally bind viruses, such as the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. They can bind it, they can block it, keep it from being able to infect human cells, and also help clear it, help remove it. When the body makes antibodies, it makes hundreds of different kinds of antibodies. Not all of them are all that effective. We've established the technology to make exactly the sort of antibodies that the body normally makes. We can make them outside of the body. We can test them and take the best antibodies, the ones that are best at binding the virus, blocking it, neutralizing it, and then putting them together in a cocktail. So we chose two of the most effective antibodies that we could find against the hundreds that the body can normally make putting them together in a cocktail, a mixture of two antibodies that had the greatest power to bind, neutralize, and protect against the virus. But also the way we select them was in a way that we predicted based on a lot of evidence, a lot of preclinical evidence, a lot of studies in, in petri dishes, but also in animals, that these antibodies would be able to protect against variants that might emerge. We even predicted some of the exact hmm variants that we have now been seeing that we're worried about. And we predicted that this cocktail that we had put together of two of the best possible antibodies that we could generate could actually not only bind and neutralize and protect against the original SARS-CoV-2 virus, but we predicted it could withstand 
a lot of these variations that are occurring. And to date, that's been the case. And, th and that's a good point, because we've been talking about whether these protect against the variants, including the Delta variant, and research has shown that it does. I do want to talk about some recent findings and a recent uh, expansion of authorization for post-exposure prophylaxis. So we first talked about giving monoclonal antibodies early on to certain patients. And first, I have to say, in terms of language, post-exposure prophylaxis. When we're trying to explain that to patients, we're even trying to explain it to clinical colleagues. What exactly does that mean? And I'm going to be honest, George, why does it have to be so difficult in terms of, of language? Because we're really using it for prevention for some people, but we're not using that term. Well, as you said, the nomenclature is complicated. It's complicated even to me. I'm not sure I understand why the rationale and the reason for all these words. But as you said, initially our authorization was for people who were already infected. And for those high risk people who had a high chance of progressing from being infected to becoming very mm -hmm. sick, hospitalized, maybe even dying, we had an authorization to give it to these patients. And the data said as early as possible was the better. And we could prevent by more than 70% hospitalization and death in these early infected individuals. The most recent authorization is for prevention. Um, and it's for a limited degree of prevention. It's for people who have either already been, had a high risk exposure, that is, they were in close contact yeah. with somebody who had COVID-19, so they're at risk of developing COVID-19, and they don't have it yet, or they're at risk of coming into contact with somebody. So for example, if you're an institution, let's mm -hmm. say, at a hospital or a nursing home uh, or a prison setting where there's an outbreak and you might now be at risk, that is the setting in which this could be indicated to be used as a preventative measure to keep the people who have not yet been infected from being infected. Do you, do you think we'll start seeing an expansion of monoclonal antibodies, perhaps for those persons who are immunocompromised? We believe that the immunocompromised are a very important population that could really benefit from receiving our antibody cocktail on a monthly basis to keep them protected, to substitute for the fact that they don't generate antibodies in response to vaccines. So we think that's an important potential future authorization, which we are discussing with the FDA. Once again, the whole point of the vaccine is to generate the body's own sure. antibodies. If the body can't respond to the vaccine by generating its own antibodies, we believe those are perfect mm -hmm. candidates to get our own monoclonal antibodies cocktail as a substitute sure. uh, for what you want to get from the vaccine. Now, here you have some compelling data, yet, like everything else, things don't go as planned. In terms of the rollout, people thought it was just for celebrities, it was sent to hospitals and infusion centers that initially were overwhelmed. We told patients not to come to the hospital, so they're coming too late. What have you learned from kind of the hiccups, the bumps along the way, which happen all the time, but in the setting of a pandemic, when we're trying to reach people, does you know cause some concerns? I, I think that what we learned is it's, it's very hard to be trying to fly an airplane while you're still in the midst of building it. You know, for society, this is really the first time that we've dealt with something like this and trying to implement new weapons simultaneously, such as vaccines and also treatments. I think it's complicated messaging. It was hard to communicate the importance and the value of both vaccine mm -hmm. approaches, but also having an antibody cocktail that could act as a treatment, but also as a substitute for the yeah. vaccine for those people who don't respond well to the vaccine. These are complicated messages. It's hard enough just mm -hmm. to try to get enough people vaccinated, let alone getting treatments to the people who need them, let alone talking about other applications of antibody cocktails, such as for prevention. Yeah. So I think we've just relearned how complicated it is in the midst of a, uh, an emergency situation to really implement effective uh, weapons against disease. Yeah. And we all have to try to do better. Um, and we're trying to. So what do viewers need to know? A lot of times their doctors are, are not gonna recommend it either because they're not aware of the indications, it's just not top of mind, they don't know of an infusion center or know that it's sub-Q. So for listeners and viewers watching that are thinking, hey, I could be a candidate, or, or you know what, maybe a loved one should be able 
to get this. What do they need to do? How do they find out more information? Yeah, as I said, I think messaging has been complicated. It's hard for government leaders mm -hmm. and policy leaders to explain everything yeah. all at once. And so there's been a tremendous focus, and rightly so, on making sure that as many people as possible get vaccinated. But the message that needs to get at is that if you're already sick, either because you didn't get the vaccine or because you have a breakthrough infection, and if you're at high risk of advancing to serious disease, there is a treatment out there that is highly effective in preventing serious disease, hospitalization, and death. And that everybody should consider doing that and, and consider looking into it. And, and we need to point this out, uh, as you say, because we know that cases are, are way up and 99% of them are in the unvaccinated. Right. So there's many people that could benefit from this therapeutic option. And what the authorization says, if you just found out mm -hmm. that you were <laughs> at an encounter mm -hmm. where somebody else has now been diagnosed right. with COVID, you qualify as having had a high risk encounter. So maybe you shouldn't wait until you get yeah. sick. Go to your doctor, especially if you haven't been vaccinated, and get the Regen Cove antibody cocktail. Mm -hmm. It can keep you from getting sick. And there's no cost to patients, correct? That, that's important yeah. to, this to is, point this out. This is a, a really important point. Uh, the government is providing mm -hmm. these doses for free uh, to individuals for both treatment and for prevention. So how's the COVID pandemic change the way that you develop new molecules, the way you think about research, even how you conduct research? Well, it is definitely true that uh, for most of us at Regeneron, it was just adding another full-time job on top of our already full-time jobs. We did not stop our efforts mm. to cure cancer, to cure blindness, to cure mm -hmm. asthma, to cure an assortment of other diseases, or to explore whole new therapies like gene modification mm -hmm. in humans. But people started working round the clock, 24 seven, to add on this effort to fight back against COVID-19. So people really pushed themselves to the limit and, and very large numbers of, of people across the board from those doing the earliest discovery work in the labs led by Christos Kiratsus, who led our effort here to those working on manufacturing and ultimately in distributing the drug at, at, at the back end. So everybody throughout the company has, has literally pushed themselves to the limit. We have to understand it requires decades and decades of investment in new capabilities and new technologies to then have the power to respond to mm -hmm. any particular disease or in this case to a pandemic. Nobody turns on a dime. It may appear that way to the outside that people changed what they're doing and so forth. Yes, people worked 24 seven, added another full-time job to their job. These people are scientists. Everybody mm -hmm. who had the company, incredibly devoted, dedicated commitment to making a difference and really helping out the world here, especially since we were at the epicenter in the early days of the, of the pandemic mm -hmm. and we saw it firsthand, so many loved ones uh, affected by this disease. But the real advances were those that were made over the last few mm -hmm. decades that allowed us to respond. And this is something that's so critical for the world to understand. There's nothing more important for us as a species, as a humanity, to be able to have the tools to fight mm -hmm. back against existential threats, whether it be pandemics or climate change. Mm -hmm. We have to be investing in new innovation. It's all about relentless innovation and our commitment as a society that we have to be making those investments, both in academia, mm -hmm. in the case of biotech, we have to be increasing our investments in the NIH and in academic research, but we also have to be encouraging investment in the industry, in the private sector in biotech for people to make the billions of dollars worth of investments that are required to empower these technologies sure. to the point that when we need them, we have them and we can utilize them and we can employ them to fight mm -hmm. back. How's COVID changed your leadership style? It's hard to work from home, as you point out, when you're trying to do lab at the bench. There's only so many things you can do by simulation. How has COVID changed that style for you in terms of, of dealing with your employees around the world? Well, of course, our lab people, out of necessity, I mean, they are true heroes. Mm -hmm. I, I put them up there with first responders. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were coming to the labs every day, risking 
you know, their, their own health and, uh, and, and, and lives in order to try to make a difference to the world. And many of us, myself, I kept coming in every day trying to help lead the efforts mm -hmm. along with other uh, major leaders through these efforts. I don't believe you can do our kind of science virtually. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work. Uh, and we've recently allowed for a lot more uh, meetings in the, the old style, mm -hmm. and I think we've all recognized that the science that we do that has made us leaders over the last couple of decades in the biotech industry, bringing some of the most innovative mm -hmm. technologies, approaches, and new medicines to the world, all depended on people interacting, brainstorming in an incredibly magical mm -hmm. way with each other. And we lost a lot of that ability to do the brainstorm. We could move the work, we could move the science because we had heroes at the benches working. We were able to do that. But in terms of new ideas, in terms of brainstorming the next great solution to some problem that, that we didn't understand mm -hmm. before, a lot of that has taken a hit. And many of our leaders, now that we've started mm -hmm. to get a little bit back together, and let's hope the Delta virus doesn't uh, turn us backwards, have commented all the last few weeks that the magic is back now that we have a chance mm -hmm. not to be on these virtual calls where you can't really do what we evolved to do, which is truly you know, synergize mm -hmm. with each other, you know, look at each other, understand what we're thinking without even saying it. Uh, those special kind of interactions that are required for optimal brainstorming and synergizing, um, that can only occur, you know, face to face in meeting rooms. And I hope we're, we're going to no. be back able to do that. I'm going to ask you some predictions, if I may. Do you think we're going to get at a point where we have eradication, elimination? We have some general baseline endemic COVID, like the flu, all the time. What's your best bet? We were worried about exactly the situation that we're seeing now, which is evolving variants sprouting up mm -hmm. all over the place, and in some cases, perhaps defeating some of our mm -hmm. initial approaches. So that's what we're preparing for. Um, I think that the virus has already proven that it's not going to be easy to eradicate. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be easy to create herd immunity. There's going to be variants that pop up that are going to defy us over and mm -hmm. over again. And so we're already coming up with second and third generation treatments and preventions mm -hmm. ourselves. So we are planning to be prepared for whatever comes at us. And, and I can only hope that you know everybody else is doing the same, and I'm sure they are. I know the vaccine makers are trying to make mm -hmm. second and third generation vaccines and so forth. So unfortunately, right now, this seems like this is going to be a fight that's going to take some of our best and our brightest quite a while to get it totally under control. Are we better prepared for the next pandemic? Let's hope we can uh, better deal with this pandemic before we have to deal with the next pandemic. Well, thank you, George, for taking the time again today. All right. Thank you, John.